Hello, and welcome to Lopes All Movies. Today's episode will be the final part of my conversation with Professor Leach on the films of Alfred Hitchcock. Last time, we talked broadly about Hitchcock's history and some of his early works in the British film industry. This time, we get into a few more of his British films and discuss what sets them apart from his later American films. We also consider the best way to get into Hitchcock for the uninitiated, so if you're curious, be sure to stay tuned. So we've been talking a little bit about just kind of Hitchcock in general, some of his British movies, and we, we've kind of touched on this just a little, but just as a, a simple question to get a little bit back into them, what do you think it is, if if anything, that sets apart his British movies from his American movies specifically? <laughs> like, what do you think the the big dividing line is? And I think like, just just to start, like one thing that I thought recently, because I just watched the other day Foreign Correspondent, which was like, I guess his second American movie. Yeah. And I was immediately, like, having watched so many of these British movies um, leading up to that, immediately struck by how expensive Foreign Correspondent looked. Because the, I'm sure the American film industry in Hollywood at that time especially was significantly more able to, to do crazy things. And, like, the special effects on Foreign Correspondent still look crazy to me today. Like, the matte paintings and the set design and the, the, the climax that, with, uh, with a plane crash. Uh, like that that kind of thing immediately struck me as like they never would have been able to do that in in the british movies which are a little bit more grounded i think but that that's just something that stuck out to me i wonder if there's anything else that sticks out to you i'm tickled that you mentioned for a correspondent because it's my idea of a 1940 movie that was really expensive and is determined to let you know that <laughs> yeah. it's really expensive oh i you, you could tell <laughs> all the crowd scenes, all the big production numbers. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's got an amazingly long cast, and many of the cast members are quite expensive. Hitchcock famously wanted to get Gary Cooper for it. Mm -hmm. and I think he would have been great, but Joel McRae's pretty good, too. Sure. So what, what people generally say when they contrast English Hitchcock to American Hitchcock is the films are longer. They're more melodramatic. Mm -hmm. they, um, they tend to be more monotonic. Rebecca would be a great example of a film that finds a tone and then maintains it throughout. Mm -hmm. This is something I'm, I'm fond of saying about a film more like Dublin Indemnity. Mm -hmm. Dublin Indemnity does not have like comic interludes. Um, right, you know, yeah. it, it finds a kind of a single zone very early sure. on in the movie and it sticks with it for the whole. And if, you, if you're not into that zone, you're not, not going to have a good time during that movie. Right, yeah. Um, Foreign Correspondent, interestingly, is kind of throwback in this regard. Because it really is episodic, it's all over the place, not only in terms of location, but in terms of tone. So we can say bigger stars, bigger budgets, longer running times. I think all these things are true, but for me, the single most important difference between Hitchcock's English films and his American films is the contrast between what Hitchcock himself called surprise and suspense. Mm -hmm. Hitchcock famously preferred suspense to surprise. Right. You know, his example is the two of us are talking here, all of a sudden a bomb goes off and it blows us both up. Mm -hmm. That's surprise. But now, let's say before the scene with the two of us starts, we show somebody sneaking into the room and planting a bomb under the table. Uh, better yet, we can see what time it's going to go off. Now mm -hmm. the audience has 10 minutes of suspense instead of one second of surprise. So right. Hitchcock said, I prefer suspense to surprise. This, of course, is like saying, of uh, the men who knew too much in 1934 is the work of a talented amateur. Hitchcock <laughs> loved surprise. Uh, yeah, imagine no, for Psycho sure. with no surprise, for instance, sure. which is the way that most people see Psycho these days. They know mm -hmm. perfectly well what's going to happen. Right. Um, but I think that Hitchcock's English films, almost without exception, rely more consistently on surprise than his American films. Interesting. And here, I'd invoke a distinction that Woody Allen, Woody Allen, of all people, made between Charlie Chaplin's laughs and Buster Keaton's laughs. Allen said, Chaplin likes suspense laughs. When you watch a Chaplin film, you can see that something funny is happening. You can see where it's going. And mm -hmm. a laugh is rising in you. And you're mm -hmm. waiting for the climax so that you can let it out. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, so the Chaplin is really milking these moments. He builds the films around the moments. But Keaton is much more of a throwaway kind of comic. He'll put mm -hmm. in laughs that are so subversive that most people won't notice them. Mm -hmm. um, he'll slip things in that are sort of meant to not be noticed by most people. And mm -hmm. therefore the films are more layered 
and are more, uh, for Alan, more interesting to watch repeatedly over and mm -hmm. over again. I'm not going to take sides in this dispute. Sure. Um, suspense is good. Surprise is good, too. But I think that Hitchcock's English films tend to be more surprising in large ways. I don't necessarily mean their stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in the fact that Hitchcock develops scenes so that it's not obvious where each scene is going before mm -hmm. it gets there. Uh, and I think this is much less likely to be true in the American films. In Foreign Correspondent, for instance, which I said just now was all over the place, in almost every scene of Foreign Correspondent, it's pretty obvious where the scene is going. Mm -hmm. There are surprises like the assassination of Van Meer, for instance, yeah. on the steps. Sure. And even that, we get a little sneak preview a couple of seconds before it comes. Uh, you know, the reporter drops the camera and we see the gun. Right, yeah. Um, in in Hitchcock's English films, I think the surprises are much more unexpected. And one way to talk about this would be to talk about Peter Lorre. Sure. Um, the really cool thing about Lorre's performance in The Man Who Knew Too Much is that it's almost literally true that from moment to moment, you don't know whether he's going to say something funny or say something scary. Sure. You don't know whether he's going to scowl or smile. You don't know whether he's going to threaten you or act disarming. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when he does say menacing things, you don't know whether he's serious. Yeah, there's definitely like a, a lot of those scenes between him and the father are like, it, 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 it's like they're both on the same level, it feels like, where they're, they're quipping at each other in a kind of a droll way, that kind of a very British way. Yeah, the father is trying to play along. With Adam. Right. That's the Laurie character's name. But as the scene goes on, you realize the father isn't nearly as good at this. Right. Yeah. It. I mean, nobody nobody does these switches like Peter Laurie. And mm -hmm. I assume that's the reason that Hitchcock wanted him for the secret agent. And mm -hmm. he does something like the same thing in Secret Agent, but it doesn't come off nearly as well. It's mm -hmm. a bigger part. It's a showier part. And understatement is what Abbott is all about. In right, the Man yeah. Who Knew Too Much. But it's, it's not just Abbott. I mean, think of all the scenes in The Man Who Knew Too Much, like the scene that you mentioned at the dentist's office. So that's a great scene. You think, oh, I know where this is going. Oh, dentist's office, paranoid. Oh, fearful, mm -hmm. threatening. Oh, somebody screams. Then Clive <laughs> comes out of the office. It turns out he had a tooth pulled. <laughs> So, you know, there's this great comic anticlimax. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think no matter how much you, you love the remake of The Man Who Knew Too Much, it's definitely a more self-serious film sure. than the English film is. Oh, definitely, um, yeah. Part of that starts with the casting. We've talked about this over and over again. If you cast Jimmy Stewart and Doris Day as your leads, the audience is not going to believe that they will get killed. Right. They're just not going to believe that. Right. Um, whereas in the... English man who knew too much, it's almost true. I mean, it turns out to not be true, but it feels as if anything could happen at any moment to any mm -hmm. character. Sure. Um, and that gets set up at the very beginning of the film. Do you remember the first murder in that film? It is so cool. With the, uh, that while they're dancing and yeah. through, the, through the glass. Yeah, it's, it's, great. it's in the middle of a dance, which is also in the middle of the husband's practical joke. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. The wire. Bob Lawrence is jealous of the fact that Louis Bernard has been paying attention to his wife, Jill. Mm -hmm. So as revenge, he hooks up. She's, she's been crocheting. She says a, a, a sweater, a jumper or some kind of vest. And it's mm -hmm. not for Bob. It's for Louis. Sure. Uh, to wear next to my beating heart, he says. <laughs> so Bob hooks up the, uh, the end of the yarn to a, 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 one of the buttons at the back of Louis's coat. Right. And the more they dance, the more the knitting, the crocheting becomes unraveled. And mm -hmm. also the, uh, the yarn gets tangled with all these other couples mm -hmm. who take more and more care to avoid it. So <laughs> this air of sort of benign hilarity that doesn't have a punchline right, settles yeah. over the whole scene. And the punchline comes when somebody taps Louis on the shoulder about the yarn and he looks down and there's a pop and you realize what he's now looking down on is not the yarn, but the bullet in his chest. Mm -hmm. um, that's an incredible surprise, it seems to me. Everything Absolutely. this team had been saying, we're going in a completely different direction. All of a sudden, bam. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the indication that says to you, don't count your chickens before mm -hmm. they're hatched in this movie. We could do anything we wanted to you at any moment in the film. That's um, interesting. It's interesting to me, and in many ways, I think that the 1934 Man Who Knew Too Much is Hitchcock's most subversive film. It's not depressing, not negative, has a happy ending that I actually believe, although it's a very sudden happy ending. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, the Sabrina, and a lot of blood is spilt along yes, the way, yes. to be fair. <laughs> but it's mostly the bad guy's blood. That's true. That's true. Uh, there is that one cop, you know, who goes up to the door, knocks on it, and gets shot down. That it, was a big surprise. That is sudden. <laughs> and and that's another way of Hitchcock saying, you know, I'm 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 Alfred Hitchcock. I can do whatever I want. By the way, mm-hmm. gifted amateurs do not do that. <laughs> um, I think that having established that level of subversiveness with the audience, that is, don't get too comfortable because I could pull the rug out from under you at any second. Mm-hmm. Um, Hitchcock almost immediately begins to dial it back. Mm-hmm. So that in the 39 steps, there are lots of surprises, but most of them are much more gentle surprises. Mm-hmm. Um, they get telegraphed um, and um, they fit into a singular genre. Um, um, I, I feel very comfortable call, calling the 39 steps a thriller or a man on the run movie, or even a comic thriller. Mm-hmm. But none of those labels seems to me quite adequate for the first man who knew too much. Mm-hmm. Um, it's neither fish nor fowl, and I think that's what it wants to be. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think that Hitchcock's dialing down this element of surprise, which is something I associate with his American films, actually began even before he came to America. But mm-hmm. you can still see, uh, scene for scene, that the English films, the films that follow the man who knew too much, the suspense you know, sextet, as everybody calls them, beginning with yeah, right. nine steps. Those are more surprising than the American films. If you like Absolutely. surprise, you'll like them. Yeah, I was thinking of, uh, like, as you started mentioning that, I was thinking of Sabotage in particular, because I think the, the surprise in that movie is, like, he's not really going to do it, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? But then he does, and you keep thinking, like, no, nah, that can't possibly be right, until, like, it's... It, beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's confirmed <laughs> that what, what you saw actually happened and uh, I, it, apparently he was upset by by the audience response with that. And he 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 said in a lot of interviews after that, where he was like, you know, in, in a, after a sequence of suspense, you need to give give some sort of release for the audience. You can't have it be something that uh, you can't have you can't have a big thing of suspense and then hit them in 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 the face with something really bad. Yes. Um, but it I, I think that's a great example of what you're talking about because sabotage he does it unapologetically. Um, not only does yeah. not only does he do it unapologetically, but after that, I mean, right after Stevie's sister Winnie gets the news, uh, she famously goes into the cinema that her husband runs. Mm-hmm. She passes through it. She can see the Disney film that's showing mm-hmm. Hillcock Robin. She stops to watch it, and then she begins to laugh. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a horrifying moment. It's it's not the yes, worst it news is. that she's ever going to get in her entire life. She's been weeping. And now, all of a sudden, this Walt Disney movie is making her laugh. She must hate herself. Um, So not only does Hitchcock not give you the release, he amps up the sort of cognitive dissonance. He says, Mm -hmm. yeah, this is is really creepy. This is unpleasant. This is now flirting with tragedy. But, but, you know, don't forget to laugh. I I think most audiences (laughs) do not want to get that message. It's a really hostile, confrontational message. (laughs) So... My my whole thing over this this past couple of weeks, past couple of months, we've been just because of the the pandemic and there not being movies to watch. A lot of what we've been doing on the show and just in in general, just for my own purposes, is going back watching older movies that we maybe have wanted to get to. And I've always been somebody who's always interested in doing the deep dives. You know, it's like if there's a major filmmaker who I like or or it, uh, a musician, a band that I like, I want to know everything about them, right? So I did this with the Beatles in, in music. I did this with Kurosawa. And now I'm kind of doing this with Alfred Hitchcock. And I think in, in watching all these movies and in find, like finding them very interesting and, and worth discussing, I wonder, what do you think is kind of like, and we've been talking about his British movies, so you could think like, if you're interested in, in getting into watching some of these movies and, ha- and having some understanding of them, is is starting at the beginning a good idea or is it better to look to some of the, the more famous American films um, and as, as that kind of being your gateway? Because for me, it's definitely like a grab bag. I saw a couple of them here and there and then it's like, oh, uh, maybe I'll now I'll watch some of the British movies and then I'll, now I'll watch some of the American movies again. Um, and I, at one point, like when I got, I first got Hitchcock, Hitchcock Truffaut, I was looking at him. I was like, oh, I, I couldn't possibly read this without knowing all the movies. So I'm just going to watch all of them. And I was like, okay, I'll start with The Lodger. And then immediately after that, I was like, okay, I'm not, I can't just like go chronologically and watch all of them. I'm just going to watch whatever I want to watch and I'll read along. But I, I wonder, it, what, what do you think is kind of that, 
a good way to get into Hitchcock if you're interested in that. If my only two choices were chronologically for greatest hits first, I would definitely go for greatest hits first. Mm -hmm. um, even last year when I was going through all the Hitchcock films myself, because I was writing a long article and getting ready to teach another, another class, I specifically thought, I'm not going to watch these chronologically. I'm mm -hmm. going to vary dates. Uh, I'm going to vary tones. I'm going to vary uh, actors and actresses. Um, you know, I'm going to try to get a patchwork Hitchcock. That sure. worked very well for me. Um, so autobiographically, uh, when I was a kid, um, the Hitchcock films that were on TV a lot were Vertigo and North by Northwest. Um, after watching the first scene of Vertigo, I hid under the bed. <laughs> so I didn't see Vertigo. My sister saw it. They were braver than me. I mm -hmm. did see North by Northwest and I thought it was terrific. But the film that really got me hooked on Hitchcock, I didn't see until I was in college. It was Notorious. Oh, I just watched Notorious recently. Yeah. And I thought, I didn't know Hitchcock made movies like this. <laughs> In fact, Notorious is a much more typical Hitchcock product than Vertigo or The Birds mm -hmm. or Psycho are. Sure. Uh, he made many more films like Notorious, although to my mind, most of them not as good. I think Notorious is an exceptional film of its kind. Um, but that was the film that made me think, I must see more. Mm -hmm. um, and from that point on, for instance, when I was in my first year in graduate school, uh, one of the film societies on campus featured Hitchcock. So I watched the films in the order in which they showed them, which mm -hmm. was more or less chronological, but it didn't matter to me. I would have watched them in whatever order they, they mm -hmm. watched them in. So my advice to people who are new to Hitchcock, not only would I start with the, the 50s films, but I would start with a very specific film. Um, either North by Northwest, which I think is like the Sarah Lee of the Hitchcock era. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody doesn't like North by Northwest, although some mm -hmm. people think it's over long, or Rear Window. Sure. Um, I think those are the two ideal entry level points. If you're mm -hmm. into black and white, I would wholeheartedly recommend Notorious. Mm -hmm. um, but two of the British films, I think, are great entry points to Hitchcock The 39 Steps and The Lady Vanishes. Uh, I think those are films that can be enjoyed from beginning to end, even if you have no idea who Alfred Hitchcock is. Mm -hmm. I would not say that about The Man Who Knew Too Much. Uh, that's a film that I have a very high regard for, but I think it it watches much better if you've seen other Hitchcock mm -hmm. films. Sure. Um, just as I think Psycho, you know, which many people have used as an introduction to Hitchcock, to me is a terrible introduction to Hitchcock. It is much more interesting if you've seen other Hitchcock movies. Yeah, no, I, I would definitely, I don't think that Psycho was the first Hitchcock movie I watched, even though I, I know that that's one that like repeatedly gets put on like, I guess like film class syllabuses or even just if you're looking at best Alfred Hitchcock movies on the internet, you know, Psycho will come up because it has such a reputation. So, so I know that people watch it. Yeah. Uh, the last time I taught Hitchcock, I started with the birds because I thought this will hook people. I didn't want to do it chronologically because I didn't want people leaving the class because you know, <laughs> they thought, oh, the, you know, it's going to take forever for this to get good. <laughs> but the birds was a mistake. The birds is a poor entry into Hitchcock, I think. For one thing, it makes you think his other films are going to be like that. And none of them is like that. Not even Psycho. Mm -hmm. uh, Psycho and the birds, it seems to me, are the only truly scary films that he ever made. Mm -hmm. Uh, but The Birds is not scary in at all the same way that Psycho is. So I think it's a mm -hmm. bad entry point. Now, if we're teaching a Hitchcock course again, I would be sorely tempted to start the course with Dial M for Murder. Ooh, I haven't watched that one in a long time. The Dial M for Murder is nobody's idea of major Hitchcock, <laughs> but it's so well done. Mm -hmm. um, it's really great second tier Hitchcock. Yeah, that I, the thing I remember about Dial M for Murder was... Just the, I guess it's the opening scene where the husband is talking to the person he wants to to murder his wife. And just thinking like, this is just a very dramatic and effective conversation in a way that I'm not used to seeing from like, like usually you would think in, in you know, a movie is more than just a conversation, right? And you don't want, then Hitchcock is not somebody who is going to do the, the infamous TV thing of shots of people talking. But he doesn't. Like the way that he he frames that conversation makes it so compelling. That's that's I can't remember exactly how long that conversation is, but I'll say 10 minutes. It's pretty long from what I remember. Well, yeah. I mean, it's a real true to force. At the beginning of the conversation, you think that one guy is gonna buy a used car from the other guy. Mm -hmm. And by the time the conversation is over, one guy has hired the other guy to kill his wife. 
It's amazing getting from point A to point B in yes. such a natural way. I, mean, I really love Dial M for Murder, but I don't think anything in the film comes up to the level of that conversation for pure mm. ratcheting up gradually, mm. growing creepiness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the kind of creepiness that sneaks up you up on you a little bit at a time so that at the beginning you're saying, wait a minute, is, is this really going where I think this is going? Mm -hmm. And then you think, oh, yeah, this is yucky. Oh, yeah, it's getting <laughs> yucky. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of Dial M for Murder. Um, Robert Cummings, not my favorite, uh, but Ray Milland is so great in that role. Mm -hmm. um, and Grace Kelly, although she has very little to do in that movie, is terrific. Mm -hmm. And so is John Williams, who plays the inspector. Yeah, I'm gonna have to watch that one again. I, I watched that like a long time ago. I feel like I was I was probably like I was definitely still in college when I watched it. I think, but yeah, it definitely definitely stuck out to me back then. It is not made for Hitchcock, but I think it's a great entry point to Hitchcock. Uh, it, it does Hitchcock things, for instance, in a non-confrontational way. I, I think that's kind of an interesting like thing that I, I've recognized in, in watching a lot of his, his British movies lately and just kind of doing this this more intense dive into into his movies like there there's something really kind of nice about the the non-major works you know because I feel like sometimes you can get into this mindset where like oh it's it's not well known so it must not be worth my time or it must not be something that the 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 canon has decided is is worthy of our attention but that's really not true and I think that's something that, like, when 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 you have that realization that there's so much more to be gained from the things that aren't necessarily as well remembered, that just opens up an entire world of so many things to get from from movies. I I would I wouldn't even call like Foreign Correspondent, which I just watched, like one of my favorite movies, but I, I can't stop thinking about it just because it's so interesting and it's every, everything about it and everything that went into it and, in its creation and the the end result is so interesting to think about that. Just, just as a result of that, I feel like there's, there's just so much you can get from, from, really going into a, a person's work and watching the things that people might not remember as, as well, but are definitely still just as interesting and worthy of, of consideration. I would, I would completely agree with all that. The only thing I would add is that this light bulb moment. Oh wow, forgotten works can be just as interesting as classic works. Um, that's a very double-edged moment. So on the one hand, it says, oh, this whole new world is open up to me. You know, it's not just the classics. It's not just the canon. It's all these other things. They're, they're all potentially really interesting. And that's true. They all are. But the thing that goes along with that is this immediate realization, life is short. <laughs> and suddenly, yeah. my to-do list has, has now grown 100 times longer. <laughs> so the well, that's the, that's the nice thing about this. Is this what I want to do? Yeah. Well, that's the nice thing when you choose to just like limit yourself to a director, right? Where it's like, oh, I want to watch Alfred Hitchcock movies. Well, luckily for you, you have a lot of Alfred Hitchcock movies you can watch. And you, you could finish every Alfred Hitchcock movie before the end of your life. <laughs> There's 50 something of them, but that, that is feasible. Yes. Right? So yes. it, if, if you take the, the logical next step and say any movie ever made could be interesting, then yes, you're certainly putting yourself at a disadvantage. But um. Uh, I, I at, at any rate, I think if if there's a filmmaker that you like or just a thing that you're you're interested in, there's definitely no reason to limit yourself to just watching the things that everybody says you should watch. Um, yeah, and here yeah. I generalize and say not only is this a, a these deep dives are a great feature of film watching, they're also a great reason to be in college. <laughs> college, sure. college is the place it seems to me where people learn to do deep dives. Absolutely. Uh, but it's a mistake to say college is the place where you ought to learn what is worth deep diving into. What mm -hmm. college ought to be teaching you is you can do this on your own. You don't need us. Um, yeah, sure. you know, now that we have shown you, for instance, how to do it with, I don't know, Alfred Hitchcock or Orson Welles or Steven Spielberg or you know, Quentin Tarantino mm -hmm. or whoever, Martin Scorsese, you could do it with any filmmaker. You could do it with an author. You could do it with mm -hmm. a choreographer. You could do it with a painter. Um, sure. and, and, and they don't even have to be organized or, around auteurs. You could do it with 21st century video games, for instance. You could, like you could do it with Fast and Furious, for crying out loud. <laughs> um, you know, one person's deep dive is going to be another person's waste of time. Mm -hmm. But if you decide, yes, this is it. This is it for me. That's a wonderful activity to be engaged in, no matter what the it is. Absolutely. And I think... Uh... Uh, definitely taking a lot of your classes in college was a big part of that for me because there was 
these like I think the first class I took of yours was a class on romantic comedies, which at the time I didn't have any like particular interest in the subject. I was just like, oh, this you know whatever. It's a movie class. This should be interesting. And just thinking about like you could do a romantic comedy deep dive on filmmakers who spent most of their career making romantic comedies, and I think that would be a very interesting thing to do. But beyond that, you're also like I also took a class in film noir, which uh, now like I'm, I'm so glad I took that class because having watched so many of those movies from like the 30s and 40s now i don't think about it anymore when i want to watch a movie that's that old it doesn't like i don't think oh man this is going to be old you know what i mean <laughs> because i don't have to i already have the experience of having watched them i know what i'm getting into like i just recently watched uh the the nicholas ray movie they live by night and i was just thinking oh. like oh this you know this this would be a great movie to to talk about in uh, <laughs> a leech class because uh, I remember so many of our conversations were like, how does this read to you as noir? And there's there's so many questions you could say about They Live By Night in that uh, in that framework. And I think it would then. But but yeah, just just in general, I think it's such a great uh, a great thing to kind of get that that experience. Amen. Uh, they Live By Night, a classic example of a great noir that's also a great romantic movie. Yeah. Uh, not many noirs you can say that about. <laughs> and, and also great introduction to Nicholas Ray, who also made movies like In a Lonely Place, which I believe is now streaming. Oh, on nice. One of my platforms, Amazon or Netflix or mm -hmm. Hulu. It's it's on one of the few platforms that I get. <laughs> I haven't seen In a Lonely Place for a long time. I, I can hardly recommend it. It's not Hitchcock, but it's got Bogart and Gloria Graham. So um, <laughs> and, and Ray's direction is spot on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it, it's just it's it, it's been it's been a lot of fun, I think, going going back and and trying to watch some of these these things that I may have missed before. And, if, and of course, you're right. There's an infinite amount of things that that you could you could end up watching. But I think Hitchcock is a great place to start personally. Well, I think it's there's... a little bit like, uh, you know, a kid leaving a candy store, no matter what you bought, even though you may be thinking, oh, I should have gone for the gumdrops. Oh, I should have gone for the candy corn. What you bought is going to give you pleasure. That's pretty yeah. much a guarantee. Exactly. Exactly. I was so disappointed when uh, I I finished watching like most of the classic Kurosawa movies back in like college, and I was like, oh no, like I, there's not going to be any more to watch. But uh, now I'm thinking like, well, there, there there still are the handful that I haven't seen, even if they're not the ones that everybody talks about all the time. Um, and there's some that I like I still haven't seen uh, Ron, which you know of course like <laughs> how how do you how have you not seen that one if you say you like Kurosawa, but uh. With with Hitchcock, I'm I'm currently in that same wonderful experience of going like, okay, I've only seen like twenty of these, like I got plenty more to go, and it's 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 just so wonderful and so much fun. You've got some great hours ahead of you, Joey. I would say I envy you, but I don't <laughs> envy you. I enjoy watching these movies for the second or third or fourth time myself. Uh, you know, it's not the same experience, but it's a great experience. Yeah, exactly. I I watched The Wrong Man like twice in in like a couple of weeks and notorious twice in a couple of weeks too because i wanted to show my my brother <laughs> the movies i was like oh this is really interesting we should we could talk about these in the show sometime and uh yes there's there's an endless amount of things to get from them, i feel like amen <laughs> well i appreciate you talking with me again on on hitchcock i know uh this is definitely one of your areas of expertise i'm sure so it's it's been really a pleasure getting to talk with you. I, I feel like I could go on forever just about specific movies and and stuff because there's there's so much to to think about. The pleasure has been mine, Joey. But why don't we uh, end by agreeing that this talk has been like a British Hitchcock movie, <laughs> episodic. The tones have varied all over the place. <laughs> lots of surprises along the way. It's not a tone piece. It's not a mood piece like Rebecca. Uh, it's if it's if it's like one of his American films, it's like Foreign Correspondent, but on a much lower budget. <laughs>